So with the change in the advice from the bishops, let me welcome you from Burford Church this morning. And the great news is that we hope that in the next few weeks, the advice will be such that we might better open our buildings for private prayer. We'll let you know as soon as we know anything. Well, I was speaking to a friend earlier in the week, and she said to me that, if she's honest, Sunday evening she took a turn for the worse. Why? Because she'd been hoping there would be some change. She'd had enough uh, living alone, not really seeing people. Uh, it, she'd had enough, wanted some relief. She was pretty despondent, and if I'm honest, I was pretty despondent too. Oh, I mean, maybe you're currently trying to homeschool your children, uh, trying to do something of a job, uh, keep the home going. In so many ways, you're delighted to have the family around. Yes, of course. But there is no let up. It's relentless and endless, and you just want some space, some relief. Uh, maybe you're one of our key workers. Thank you for all that you're doing for us. But all that nervous energy is exhausting. You know, asking each day, is this the day in which I catch something? You too are in need of a break and some relief. Maybe you're someone who's trying to keep your business going. The downturn's hitting hard. It's causing loss of sleep, lots of uncertainty. You're having to let good people go. It's not what you signed up for. So just a bit of relief would be great. Or maybe you're ill. Or you've got family who are ill and you're unable to see them and support them. The desire is for a break. You want relief, rescue. And actually, as we look at our world, yes, a world that is currently dominated in the headlines by COVID, but actually it's a world of evil, hatred, cruelty, war. A world crying out for relief. And it is in that world, as we turn to the book of Exodus, it's into that world the people Israel knew oh so well. They were people who needed liberation. They were slaves worked hard. Uh, their boys were being thrown into the Nile. Where is it that they would get liberation from? Well, in chapter 2, verse 23, we can see some places where it doesn't come. We see, first of all, that it doesn't come from the passing of time. During that long period, they continue to groan out, and they are still enslaved. They don't get relief from politics. Uh, the king of Egypt died, yet another king comes in and they still cry out. In fact, their liberation doesn't even come from the man Moses. He attempted uh, a liberation. He, he killed the Egyptian, maybe hoping that people would sort of gather round and follow him. But their only comment was, who made you ruler and judge over us? They rejected him and his leadership. So where would relief be found? Well, verse 24 of chapter 2, God heard their groaning. We see it first. Uh, they cry out, their cry goes up to God, and God hears. And it is that that moves things. That as God's people pray, things begin to happen. And then relief is finally found as not only does God hear... As we thought about last week, God remembers his covenant. As God acts on his promise, that is what will change everything. It's not that he ever forgot. But from a human perspective, the action that is about to take place is so decisive, it's as if someone were remembering. Where will God's people find relief? They find it in their prayers and in the promises of God. So what about the relief that we're looking for? Yeah, relief from COVID, uh, relief from all suffering. If actually, don't you want to be freed from your own self sometimes? That ongoing habit that you wish you could break? That anger, frustration, the greed, the worry, the bitterness, the unfaithfulness, uh, whatever it might be. I certainly find that this town, this um, time of isolation, has only highlighted to me just how far I fall of my own standards. Being locked up and unable to get out means I just see how selfish I am. Longing for relief. And so often we try and find in all manner of places. We find relief in our finances. We might be able to spend, get something to give us some pleasure. But the finances have been hit. Sometimes we work hard so that we can play hard. And so we focus on our holidays or our leisure pursuits. But they've all been shut or cancelled. 
We try and find relief through friendships. And again, friendships are so important, but in the moment they're distanced. Maybe it's found through family. But at the moment, maybe it feels like you've had enough. Or there are other parts of your family who are too far away. And, and as a family, we only know too well how much we'd love to be with our extended family today. Or in politics. We've tried to find relief in politics, but politics can't stop COVID, can it? There's no obvious way out. And there'll always be something else, some other tragedy, some other difficulty, some other tra tragedy. Sometimes we try and find it in time, but again, uh, that's not the way. But relief comes as we pray and as God remembers his promise. So what is it that happens? How does relief come? Well, we see it most clearly as God speaks to Moses in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The Lord said, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. What do we see? We see that God comes down to set his people free. God comes down to liberate. You see, God responds to the prayers of his people and he responds to his promises. How? By coming down to rescue. And this is the good news that I, that, that, about God that I, I pray we'll grasp more and more this morning. That the God of the Bible is the God who comes down to liberate his people. God is the God who brings relief. For the people of Israel, it will be as God comes down and sends his servant Moses. Yet even that won't be enough. That sin, suffering, strife, pain, anguish, sickness, they will remain for all of them. But what is it that ends all of this? Well, supremely, it's Christmas. It ends as the Gospel writer Matthew will tell us that uh, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, Christmas is the beginning of the time, the beginning of the liberation when God comes down to rescue his people. Are you longing for relief? The promise to each one of us is that God comes, that God came. That God is the one who comes and liberates his people. We're going to pause for a moment to reflect on that. That it is God who comes down to bring relief and rest. It is as we know the God who comes down to liberate his people that we can say it is well with our soul. This song was written by Horatio Spafford after tragic events in his life. A fire that killed his son and led to his own personal economic ruin. As he sent his wife and four daughters ahead of him to Europe to find a better life uh, that he would then follow. Well, as they travelled, their ship sank, leaving only his wife alive. As he followed that ship a few weeks later, as he passed the place where he knew he had lost his precious children, he wrote these words of trust. Words of trust in a God who was with us even in trials. He knew the trials as each one of us does. But he is a God who comes down to liberate his people. And so he could say, it is well with my soul. We've been thinking about the God who comes down to liberate his people. But the question to ask really is, who is this God? I mean, think of all those people who've been transformed from terrorists to freedom fighters. Those who have led the charge for change. Well, one of the questions you want to ask is, are they a good liberator? Do I want to be liberated by them? And see, as we come to this account in Exodus 3, we begin to see something of the character of the God who comes down to liberate. We're told quite clearly in chapter 3 that it's uh, the angel of the Lord who appears in the flames of fire, verse 2. Moses sees it, it's an odd sight, and, and verse 4, the Lord sees him and calls to him from within the bush and says, Moses... Moses. And Moses says, here I am. But we begin to see something of the character of God in how God uh, displays himself. Firstly, he comes in fire. Fire, often in the Bible, is talking about holiness. 
about perfection. In fact, uh, God himself would even say, uh, you know, take off your sandals, this is holy ground. And this tells us that uh, the God who liberates is the God who is perfect in his word. So what he says is good and always trustworthy. He's also perfect in his actions. That is, he is reliable. Uh, that means the situation which they are in and the situations which we, they will be in are perfect and good in the plans of God. But here we also see something uh, that fire not only means about holiness but God's sufficiency. If you look at uh, your Bible in chapter 3, uh, just at the top, you'll see that it's probably got a title saying Moses and the burning bush. It is one of the worst descriptions in the Bible for this scene because the whole point is the bush isn't burning. I mean, if I light a match and I hold it, what happens is that my fingers will eventually burn because the wood is used up as fuel. But here, the bush doesn't burn up. The bush doesn't burn up because the fire doesn't need any fuel. It speaks of God's self-sufficiency. And we see that even more as we look at the name that God gives himself, I am who I am, next week. But this fire that needs no fuel speaks of a God having life in and of himself. He doesn't need anything else. He doesn't need a people. He graciously chooses to have some, but he generates all life. Or as Acts 17 would say, he gives all men life and breath and everything else. He is the holy and sufficient God. We need nothing more from him, than, and he gives us all that we need. So we see God as fire, holy and sufficient. But he's also the faithful God. Verse 6, I am the God of your father, of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now whenever we get this phrase in the Bible, it's always about the promises that God made to his people. And that he is the God of that promise. The promises of a great nation, a great land, and a great blessing. Uh, what are God's people liberated from? Uh, yes, from a tyrant slave master. But to what are they liberated to? Well, verse 8, to a land, uh, a great and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And I just wonder whether the people of God have become too settled. Too satisfied with second best. See, of course, before they were slaves, they had a land. It was Goshen, and it was a good land. Yes, it was in Egypt. Yes, it wasn't theirs, but it was good. Fertile soil, no more wandering around the desert to find pasture land. Yet it wasn't what God had promised. You see, God will keep his promises. And we do just need to grasp how brilliant they are, because sometimes we settle for second best. Joseph, when he died, asked for his bones to go with the people of Israel when they left. He hadn't second, settled for second best, even though he was a prince of Egypt. But God had something better for them. Where they'd grown content, they were now no longer welcome, and it wouldn't be long before they could no longer stay. You see, God works to move his people so that they will receive the promises that he had promised them. God had somewhere and something better for them. But don't you realize that when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died, they hadn't received what God had promised? Had he failed? Well, Matthew 22 tells us that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Quoting these verses, Jesus' point is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. They're living and indeed recipients of the promises God has made because the promises were not just for the land of Canaan, but something far greater. As Hebrews 11 says, all these people did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. For God has prepared a city for them, one whose architect and builder is God. You see, the land they were looking for was not just the land of Canaan, but it was something better. And it is to that same inheritance and promise that we are called. You see, our God is faithful, and what he has promised us is total liberation from all that is wrong and frustrate and evil. God has come down in Jesus Christ to liberate us, to redeem us, to rescue us from the empty way of life, to set us free from sin, to live lives that he has called us to. And I just wonder if we've got too comfy in this world. 
He's promised us total liberation, total freedom, where there's no more mourning, no crying or pain, where there is no stress or strife, where there's no isolation or loneliness, where there's no more sickness or suffering. But too often I've settled for less. I've settled for here, with all my sin, with all my weaknesses, with all the stuff in the world that I can do so little about. I mean, yes, Burford is a great place to be, but it isn't heaven. C.S. Lewis calls pain God's megaphone to call out to the world that this isn't all there is. There is something so much better that God has promised his people and he's the faithful God who will fulfill his promises. There is a sense in which this time of lockdown is really good for us. It actually encourages us to see that this is not all there is in the world. It's to make us unsettled where we may have settled for second best. It helps me to ask the question, am I living for the promises that God has made? Am I looking forward to that heavenly city where we're with God for all eternity? Or, or am I only living for here? If we want to know God, we need to know that he's the God who comes down to liberate his people. So I've been asking myself this week, actually, do I really want to be liberated? Do I really want to be rescued? Or actually, am I content with this? And so often I think we are. Or do I want him to rescue me so that I can live for him? Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. God himself came down to liberate his people, to set us free from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and one day from the very presence of sin. Yes, we're longing for relief, but that's a good thing. It should help us cry out to God that we might find relief from him. But supremely, we find relief in the God who comes down to rescue, in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who pays for our sin, defeats the power of evil, and promises that each one of us, wherever we are, each one of us that trusts in him, will be with him for all eternity. Where is relief found? It is found in the prayers of the people and in the promises of God. Who is this God? He is the holy and sufficient one who is faithful to his promises and promises that we can be with him in that heavenly city for all eternity and so as we cry out for relief let us now come to that god in prayer